So I hope everyone has enjoyed that orange blossom cake. I have, and I'm wearing it still. I've just been informed. But uh, it's time to move along. Um, we've had a wonderful, wonderful few days, and now we're going to, I'm going to introduce my friend that I uh, mentioned to you in my welcome, Noah So. Long before we knew this conference would actually be happening, it was already settled in my mind that I would ask Noah So to return as a keynote speaker. It just made sense. I strongly suggest, if you haven't already done so, that when you have an opportunity, please view Noah's long bio and first keynote on our website. Noah set the tone in her first talk in 2011 for our transnational engagement as an organization and a community, and today, in Toronto, seven years hence, I anticipate that she will let us know in her view just how well we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> My personal relationship with Noah has been a close and invaluable one over many years. So many firsts in my life have occurred because of Noah. It was upon her invitation that my first trip back to Germany after nearly half a century was to the ISD Bundestreffen. My four days in Helmarshausen was a pivotal moment in my personal journey that fueled my desire to assemble the global community of black Germans together in the US. I realized that Ruth Spencer, my fellow adoptee whom I met while attending the Bundestreffen and I were privileged far beyond what many of our peers could ever achieve. For many, going back to the motherland and engaging with the black community in Germany is a dream they will never be able to fulfill. Noah fulfilled that dream for me. I was so overwhelmed with emotions when I returned from the Bundestreffen that I was totally unable to articulate the experience to my fellow adoptees back in the US for a very, very long time. I did, however, send Noah a thank you letter, which was ultimately memorialized in Helmut Karasek's second book entitled Briefe Bewegung die Welt. Do you remember that? Yes. <laughs> this was just the beginning of what I expect will be a lifetime of sisterhood between us and the start of Noah and I making black history together, black German history together. So as you can imagine, I'm delighted and honored to present to some and introduce to others my sister friend. And after reading her very brief bio, then the next voice you will hear will be Noah Sose, who will speak to us for a few minutes about activist academia, visions and challenges for black German studies 2.0. Noah So is Germany's most prominent speaker and lecturer on the topics of black German politics, arts and resistance. She's also a writer, artist, media personality, theorist and activist. Her writings have considerably influenced German popular media and academia, and her book, Deutschland Schwarz Weiß, has become a standard in the discussion and education about racial equality in Germany. In 2001, Noah So founded Germany's first black media watchdog, Der Brauner Mob, an organization that now focuses on empowerment. She is publishing music and exhibiting conceptual audiovisual art through her own record label, Jean d'Arc Records, writing screenplays, radio dramas, and running an online academy that teaches the best practices for equality work. To many Germans, Noah So is also a household name from her television appearances and radio personality shows. Noah So is a household name my household for very different reasons. I present to you, Noah. <laughs> oh, how to live up to this. <laughs> yeah. Dear Rose, dear everybody here. I am uh, honored and delighted uh, to return as the keynote speaker for this conference, and I'm happy that there is continuity in this conference um, organized by the Black German Heritage and Research Association, and that uh, we continue to connect and represent in this discourse also in North America. Um, it's my first time in Canada, so I've tried to avoid it so far. 
because um, almost all of those of my friends who came over to Canada once they um, just returned to Germany once to pack their bags and move over. <laughs> so I w wouldn't even get a chance to ask them like, hey, what, what's it like? How was Toronto? How was Canada? Because they were already busy selling their stuff and <laughs> applying for Canadian work visa. So I thought to myself, I will no way. I will never go to Can Canada. But you know, that's not what I planned. Uh, but of course, for the Black German Heritage and Research Association and my Geschwister overseas, yeah, I got over myself, and I did the risky, the risky thing. I'm also pleased to see um, yeah, young people coming, uh, coming here to this conference for the first time. And um, I'm also honored to meet um, some people on whose shoulders I stand. And um, for example, um, Professor Fatima al um without whose work um, my, all of my work um, in this field would not even remotely be possible. Thank you for participating and uh, for your great and insightful keynote this year. So um, before I start, a small glossary. And oh yeah, by the way, I prepared a, um, a, a web a link, which I will show at the end of the presentation. And um, under this link, when you visit this link, then you can send me an email with one button, and there you will get all sorts of quotes and um, slides from the presentation, so you don't need to make an effort to um, write it down now or take pictures or stuff like that. Okay, the glossary. So, Afrodeutsche, seeing if it works. Um, whom exactly do I talk about when I use Afrodeutsche? Um, if it's about individuals, um, then I use Afrodeutsch for black people who live in Germany or are of German socialization or of German descent and who identify with the term also. Not all black people in Germany necessarily identify as Afrodeutsch um, because they don't uh, identify as a German. Some uh, of us identify by the countries of our parents or grandparents, um, regardless of our actual nationality in the passports. Many German people of color don't identify as German, simply because um, Germany is heavily opposed to the concept of binationality or multinationality. So we're not to supposed to express our multinational or multicultural or multi-ethnic heritages, identities. And um, yeah, many choose, many bow to the pressure of choosing and uh, choose the non-German one. For this reason, Afro-Deutsch can never be superimposed onto a person, um, but a person can always opt out, so to say, and say, for example, no, I am not Afro-Deutsch, I am a Ghanaian, regardless of their nationality. So much for the personal, for the individual, and concerning the structural, of course, I will, um, I will, I will use the term for individuals um, without every single person's consent. So for naming uh, the population as a whole, I also sometimes use the term Afrodeutsche, which means to me in this context, black people who live in Germany or are of German socialization or of German descent. We're very diverse. We belong to a number of diasporas. Uh, we have multiple cultures. Some families have been in Germany forever and some just arrived a week ago. Um, which is a qualifier. And apart from Afrodeutsch, I also use the, the term black Germans. And one day, hopefully, learn how to use a remote. There it is. So these, these are the terms I do use. I do not use Afro-German for good reason. I think I mentioned this like five or six years ago. Um, but I did not explain or elaborate on it, so now now's the chance. So Afro-German, Afro I can't even, won't even leave my lips. Um, it doesn't make sense. First of all, Africa is not a hyphenated prefix. Afro-Deutsch is one word, but more importantly for people who are German, 
our self-designation will of course be German, which is Deutsch, not Deutsch in some other language. While black Germans is a description, Afro Deutsch is a name. And we fought hard for that name. Before we came up with this name in the 1980s, people would call us all kinds of words. And Afro Deutsch is the self designation of a culture. And what do we respectfully do with self designations? Exactly, we don't just go ahead and change them to make them more palatable to us. Um, you know, calling sort of like I, co I compared it to calling the housekeeper Mary when her name is actually Mariam or Maria. It's, it's just a colonial tradition. So please spread the word. The name, the emancipierte name, the self-designation is Afro-Deutsch. Um, those of you who ha haven't had the chance to come to Germany yet, when you do, please have some fun uh, bringing up the word, the term Afro-Deutsch in conversations with white Germans and then watch some faces turn actually interesting colors just from <laughs> all the cognitive dissonance. This word alone is able to cause people. The term is powerful precisely because it is German and because the term is itself challenging the German phantasma that what is black cannot be German, okay? So please understand this and do not water Afro-Deutsch down um, and, and change our self-designation, thank you. So in uh, my presentation, I will talk about academic realms, but not from an academic capacity. Mm, my viewpoint and my relationship with the academia is in many ways, mm, a bit like my relationship uh, and perspective with my country, Germany. I am, in, in, in a way, of, of course I'm a part of it, but also an outsider. Some of my writing or thoughts are used in social studies, in art and humanities, mm, or I hold a guest lecture every now and then, or colloquia, uh, or work together, help students groups, that fight for more inclusion um, for people of color, black people, um, and who seek to decolonize the universities and so on. But I am not a part of everyday academic life or bound by, by any sort of in-house politics or, or some such um, thing. And um, so um, the relationship I have with academia is a dance I can opt out of any time. Um, and I work and publish freelance and completely outside academic institutions. So my focus is not really the academic world. I'm not thinking what, what can I do to help people study. You know, my focus is um, what can, how can those studies help the people. Um, and my studies I do outside of the academia are con more concerned with how we study. And, and how we are being studied lately. And to me it is important to remember that knowledge production isn't limited to academia at all. And um, nor is um, the acquisition of qualification in regards to our knowledges of resistance uh, or resilience or diasporic cultures. Um, because naturally only, only fragments of our knowledge are found in academic studies, and this is not a bad thing. Um, it's my belief that um, academic cultural studies of oppressed minorities serve us best when they focus on, on defined and precise aspects, and when they know their place. As soon as these studies believe they hold a key to uh, and a decryption of a culture, they can quickly become dangerous. Uh, collection can never catch up with the source. And no amount of academic studies, uh, of immersion or approximation can ever come close to the combination of analysis uh, with experiential knowledge. Here's one example, um, just to illustrate what I'm talking about from our own culture, from your black German culture. Um, much of our Afro-Deutsche productions in literature, 
and poetry and music and theater uh, revolve around how it feels. You have this impossible relationship with Heimat, society, cultures, Africa, Europe, America, and their respective senses of belonging. Some took it as their life's vocation, even, to pin down just how it feels and express their feelings in, in multifaceted, very poetic ways. Um, it is very complicated, if not impossible, to explain to anyone how it feels. It can even be hard sometimes to explain to yourself how it feels. And, um, and make no mistake, it's not our sense of belonging that is confused and, and challenged. It's the societies that surround us whose concepts of belonging are heavily corrupted. And uh, sort of an Afro-Deutsche rite of passage is to find a provisional navigation for all of that, to keep our sense of self intact and alive and to survive the hostile environment that insists that we don't exist, mustn't exist, can't be, and so on, without any institutional support. And somehow, many of us managed to survive and we try to make sense of it all and share what we learned by and in and for our community projects and intergenerational exchange, also between the continents, you know, where we find and inform each other about similarities or particularities and differences we might experience in being a black native in the northern hemisphere. And here the Western academia has its limits covering some crucial aspects of the Afro-Deutsche expression simply because they revolve around how it feels. It's about feelings. Academia can provide us with a vocabulary for feelings, but as soon as this vocabulary is used, it's already transformed in our activist work and, and art production and so on. And as I said um, before, I, I don't think these academic limitations are necessarily a bad thing. We import and export studies faster than we gain an understanding of those cultures. Studies are independent of an understanding of the culture. I don't know, for some this might be a provocative thought, but um, for us living in Germany, it is just common knowledge, really, because of the old school way cultural studies are, are being conducted in Germany. In many cultural studies in Germany, it's the norm, for example, to learn the grammar uh, with a, of a language without, without uh, learning to speak or even understand the language. Um, it is the norm to use textbooks by German or European authors who describe or who interpret a culture and not read anything original from original authors from the culture one is studying. Mm, it is the norm, very much so in Germany, to engage in moral debate about a culture's tradition long before having uh, acquired any kind of deeper knowledge um, about uh, or understanding of these traditions. Um, deeper understanding could come, for example, from living there for a uh, few years or so, and not as an expat in a gated community um, surrounded by other expats. It is German tradition to exclude the people of the very culture that is being studied, to exclude them from the studies about themselves, essentially. The excuse is always that the natives allegedly cannot view their cultures objectively, as if anybody could. You know. uh, when we examine cultures, of course, we can do so only ever through the lens of our own culture. Um, the real reasons um, as subjects of cultural studies we are being kept out of said studies is because it is embarrassing when the real deal is present all of a sudden and can correct the professor and disturb the constant undercurrent of supremacy that is also deeply ingrained in, in the mechanics of these studies. So in cultural studies in Germany, it is tradition to earn a degree that identifies one as an expert in a foreign culture without speaking the language, without having lived there. And then, yeah, earn a degree qualifying one 
to become the head of an NGO or institution that acts as a gatekeeper for resources for this culture, while all the people of this culture are systematically excluded from these studies. And this is why academic cultural studies are not automatically and inherently a good thing. The power imbalance between academia and non-academia is very much alive. In Germany, we do not have affirmative action or any such thing. And with small German studies and OECD country studies show that sadly, access to higher education is nowhere as dependent on social background as it is in Germany. Germany has been repeatedly reprimanded by the UN Commission of Human Rights for its inadequate understanding and implementation of structural and institutional racism. And these two things belong together, the non permeability of uh, studies for people who are not from an academic backgr background and the lack of understanding of what racism actually is. These two go together. So Germany holds the red lantern of the OECD countries in the inclusion of children who are born there but aren't members of the ethnic majority. German term used for, used for this is Migrationshintergrund, migration background. And, uh, but you acquire it from your grandparents, regardless of whether you actually migrated or, or your, your parents actually migrated or not. So with this logic, every G German person would have a, a fascismus background. Um, the term migration background is a cover-up for people of color, really, because it is not applied to white Scandinavians and, uh, or white Americans. And the same studies show, show, uh, that show how Germany discriminates against children, depending on um, background. Um, and, and, and you know, firstly, others, those children, and then ex excludes them from higher education. The same studies show that these kids show a heightened willingness to learn and a positive attitude. So while nowadays, for sheer you know, neoliberal reasons, every washing detergent company has understood that diversity is a prerequisite for staying in business or making a, being able to make good judgment or, or something like that. Um, our universities have yet to learn this. They are far, far behind um, and apart from the country overall not getting any smarter like that. Um, another effect is simply that for us, for um, uh, black people in Germany, we have a touchy relationship with the academia. Many uh, young people still, still have to move to other countries in order to be able to study. Uh, of course, some do make it through, and in the academia, despite many a circumstance to their disadvantage, mm, and some of them, many of them are doing a, a great job keeping social justice issues and black German issues on the agenda. Um, and a, a really good example, if, if not a typical one, I think is uh, the Black German Heritage and Research Association president, Rosemarie Peña, who takes it upon herself to combine research and activism and is networking all over the globe and keeps putting together conferences like this one, you know, and, and being in the academica, in the academia uh, on her own free will. Um, when young people, though, ask me where they should study, I mostly am reluctant to suggest Germany because the environment in, in Germany, in German universities, is, is so hostile. There's so much epistemic violence also still and so much immediate abuse that simply many don't survive it and get help, or not at all. While the neoliberal myth of you can do it if you work hard is still alive and well and ignoring the very real manifestations of structural racism on the psyche and, and the body. You can do it, yeah, when you happen to be supernaturally resilient and uh, very, very lucky. Your talent and your dedication and your amount of work have nothing to do with it. So that is the first 
power imbalance elephant in the room I wanted to address, uh, academic exclusion. Not a huge surprise, really, as to exclude is one of the core functions of a traditional university. A second power imbalance we need to be aware of in these regards is the is one between England and Germany and uh, between North America and Germany. British and North American individuals and voices are disproportionately acknowledged and considered compared to black German individuals and voices even concerning black German studies. This and all other concerns. And that's the case globally, but also within our own country. Because remember for Germany, we don't exist. Now, I'll show you an example that combines um, the two dynamics um, in a very illustrious way. A couple of years ago, the University of Bremen applied for a seven figures funding to build an entire faculty for black studies. This would have been the first faculty for black studies in Germany. The plan included a professor um, one and a half, actually, and, and multiple employees, and a PhD program, and so on. The human resources were already decided upon, um, so who was going to work there and employed was all set. Um, simply what was missing from this faculty plan was a single black person. So this is a grab I took from their webpage when when they still had it, had it open. <coughs> Mark the name, Professor Dr. Sabine Brot, please. And fighting with the projector. <coughs> there, okay. So for your information, none of these people were black, but white passing or something like that. Could could be, you know, but they weren't. We we know who they are. So, <laughs> um, the application for the funding was public, so, you know, I I escalated this with a uh, with a couple of friends and and also with the help of academics from overseas, and I will send you the link to what we wrote and what our demands were. It's uh, very well documented online, um, and now it's getting very very interesting. The reaction of this faculty group was, was wasn't uh, okay. Oh, so we missed that. Okay, we we better include some black people in this plan now quickly. Um, no, what they did was they just completely shut it down. They withdrew the entire application and then the preliminary um, studies groups they had. They shut it down. Like if we can't have it all for ourselves, it's not happening. Let this sink in. They'd rather not have a brand new faculty for black studies for over a million bucks if this would involve black people in any kind of salaried positions. Um, so after this fact, the faculty or wannabe faculty, um, the remnants of this group licked their wounds and wrote all kinds of nonsense, which you can also follow through the link. And uh, they sought out to engage in dialogue. Um, first of all, offering me to host a workshop for them, an anti-racism <laughs> workshop. <laughs> and I, I was like, I was really angry. I said, oh, thank you. I'm a best-selling author and, and theorist and nowhere on my webpage does it say entitlement babysitter, you know. And uh, <laughs> a workshop is informal, of course. You know, inviting me to hold a workshop does not mean they, they, they even acknowledge my analysis or those of my, my colleagues, you know. It means they think I'm their personal therapist and it's somehow my responsibility to fix them. So, yeah, once they realized they, uh, they wouldn't get around incorporating black people's analysis in this discussion because this discussion continued making larger and larger waves, so what did they do? They invited black people from North America for talks and public discussions that, um, yeah, of course, went back to square one and were, were very performative stage play uh, where 
the reluctant white Germans used all these resources to have these people fly over and educate them. And where black Germans were not welcome, included, existing. And this precisely illustrates why we need a critical discussion of black German studies in and outside of Germany. Because it is still too easy for the participants to get trapped in both those power structures that I just illustrated, the academic one, um, in, in, in the power structure of, of becoming a so-called expert on the other, and in the power structure of being in, in the dominant position over culture when it comes to jobs and discourse and historiography also, by way of academic privilege. Uh, of course, at any time in history, black Germans uh, conducted our own research. You know, Anton Wilhelm Amo wrote about the legal status of black Europeans in the, in the 18th century. Uh, he wasn't the first one or the only one. He's only one of the more prominent examples of this epoch. And what we have in common, him and all black Germans from all ages, that we need to analyze society in order to survive, in order to make sense of it all. Um, to navigate it, because we can't, uh, like it is possible in some other countries, have interactions mostly with people who share our experience. That's simply not possible in Germany. We have to deal with non-black uh, Germans in 95% uh, percent of our interactions, at least until we become freelancers who work from home. Um, and as long as we don't have kids. This is why there is uh, an abundance of black German analysis. But this analysis still is not recognized widely, not taken into consideration regarding black German studies and academic concerns, at least nowhere near enough. Can there be relations and relationships in and outside uh, the academia that challenge these power structures without automatically always reproducing them? Is there a way to practice Appreciation without appropriation. Personally, I believe it can be done, um, but it is not the default. Because um, the default is, um, would be our traditions, and our traditions are colonial. Um, so studying the other, excluding the original, seeking native informants while reserving analysis and contextualization for the hegemonic group and so forth is the default. And if we study traditionally, this is what we will get. So um, I think we need to actively make an effort to also learn and research, or not also, but first of all, learn and research and think about the very mechanics of epistemic violence and academic colonialism. Because if we don't do that, then we will unknowingly become part of the problem because we will stay trapped in these mechanics. Therefore, these dynamics and structures need to be taught and considered at the beginning, I think, of every kind of cultural studies. And of course, the majority of material and analysis and teachings need to come from the original sources, not from secondhand you know, interpretations. And it is imperative we make an effort to open black German studies, German studies generally, black European studies and on black diasporic studies to those populations who are institutionally discriminated against, who are disproportionately denied access to the studies, namely uh, black Germans and black people from all countries that do not acknowledge the existence of a black minority population. So if there was one single good thing that came out of uh, this disaster in Bremen, inviting only Americans, then it's uh, that the invited folks from the United States weren't all naive enough. And some soon found out that uh, it was fishy and what was going on. And they gave us some magnificent quotes. For example, J. Austin Williams, who said, the work is always devastating. There is nothing casual about this work. I step into the abyss and I ask them to as well. By them, meaning the colleagues who do not share the black experience. I followed the discussion on Twitter as I wasn't invited. 
Which takes me to my next suggestion. I'm still uh, a believer that after an assessment of the challenges, we, we should try to formulate some sort of next steps and take action. Otherwise, I would just indulge in the German tradition of trying to win the world championship in, in complaining, you know, but not really <laughs> doing anything. So please allow me to share some practices that proved helpful for me and the activist groups I'm in so far. So one finding was that the sources that are being presented to us are not enough. We, we also need to do our own research, including but not limited to online research. And we need to systematically widen our efforts to reach out if we take what is being presented to us. Um, then uh, th that is, that is a, a, a problem there because there are reasons why certain um, especially writings are part of the canon that is being presented to us and, and some others aren't. Um, in our concept of diaspora, black diaspora, black German diasporas, is uh, if, if our concept is that we are sort of virtually united and if we accept these virtualities as a potential advantage, just like you know much of our networking and exchange of ideas is virtual through books or blog posts or social media. So if we accept the ways we communicate um, as an integral expression of today's diasporas, then we, we also can't limit research to the sources we have at hand, to the groups that are immediately accessible to us um, or the literature that is presented, being presented to us. Um, it's my belief that we have the responsibility to actively search for more and for different sources uh, and experiences also. For example, as you probably know, people of Turkish origin are Germany's largest ethnic minority, but most people are unaware that there is a large Afro-Turkish community with a very distinct history to be found in certain uh, large regions of Turkey. Most Turkish people don't know about this, let alone let alone German people, and the Afro-Deutsche communities are now starting slowly to recognize it. Now, while a generation of um, Afro-Deutsche Turkish people emerges from German, from Germany, these connections to the Afro-Turkish people in Turkey need to be actively sought and, and taught and strengthened. My next suggestion is intersectionality now. I was once in an organization where many years ago we made the mistake to think, well, if we openly promote queer black perspectives and simultaneously those of people with disabilities, then we will just scare everybody away while we ourselves were queer and disabled. Like, I know, we actually thought that fighting for Black rights meant putting back, being vocal about black queer rights, black gender queer rights, and so on. Well, now, of course, um, I, have, uh, I have learned so much better, you know, and we know that we, we had been tricked. It's a societal coercion that translates as, no, don't go too far. You know, don't challenge too many norms, uh, especially don't piss off the patriarchy, and so on. And um, yeah, today we know that our reaction to, to suppress our more vulnerable perspectives it may be understandable from a, from a historical standpoint, but it's certainly not making sense from an activist and a standpoint and, and from a moral standpoint. And uh, without intersectionality as a focus, I believe that all our ideas and actions will be exclusory and incomplete. One guy calling himself on social media, son of Baldwin. Well, I actually don't know if it's a guy, but person. Um, put out this meme saying, if your black revolution involves the subjugation of black women, black queer people, black disabled people, your black revolution is simply white supremacy with a darker name. 
And we have the advantage that intersectionality is a black discipline. We own it, so let's own it. You know, we needn't water anything down or uh, dump anything down to make it more palatable. If I learned anything in, in activism, then it's that the opinions of the oppressed do not have to be palatable. To be true and transformative. And uh, in order to promote <laughs> intersectionalism, <laughs> because um, we're not all from the same classroom, so I don't, wasn't sure if it was still necessary to, to advertise for it or not. I thought, better safe than sorry. I gained, uh, uh, I, I collected a couple of advantages of us operating in intersectionality mode. So, yeah, okay, advantages of intersectionality mode. Um, first of all, we ourselves, We ourselves gain more perspectives. The more uh, experiences we learn about, the more knowledge we gain, the more informed our decisions and actions are, it's clear. Without intersectional thought and perspectives, the transformative undertaking is incomplete. We prevent rebranding of intersectionality. And we stay on top of the game. Intersectional theory and practice, I may add, is a black people's and indigenous people's science, and it's already being occupied by white groups, quite aggressively erasing blackness from this concept. Intersectional theory revolves around issues of race, gender, class, and so on, and there are many more markers, and disability, uh, gender presentation, and, and gender identity, just to name a few, but at its core lies the intersection of race, class, and gender. You don't just erase race from that, from the foundational equation. Yet this is precisely what many non-black academic groups and individuals are, are doing at the moment, even learning so, at least at German universities. And not only in Germany, I think. So we, we better fiercely practice intersectional thinking and action so we don't get another cultural tradition hijacked and sold back to us eventually. Like, I don't need an intersectional Elvis and Eminem. Thank you very much. No. Autonomous historiography. I'm trying to avoid the word authentic here, you know, as it's so problematic. So what I mean by this is we avoid being written, once again. When, uh, if we exclude perspectives, then these perspectives have no other choice but to team up with other folks in order to be acknowledged. And this is not only sad, but also unhelpful for our own historiography, because all those parts of our historiography are then once again collected, compiled, written, and edited by non-black people. Ouch, no, we've been there. So um, the next advantage applies to vanity. When we practice intersectionality, we are um, not coming across as irrelevant and outdated. So the little Autobahnkreuz there, you see, um, that is German for intersection, the Kreuzung. Did you think you experienced a German conference without someone mentioning Autobahn? Yeah. Think again. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so this was the little excursion for uh, to advertise intersectionality with uh, under the risk of it not being necessary anymore because you're already totally in the fan club of intersectional studies and application. So now back to my final suggest suggestions uh, for the visions for future. Sorry. Um, so yeah, I wanna advocate for generally being more deliberate about whom we share our personal stories, our biographies with. For a reason I will explain shortly. Oh. Help. So, okay, what I said uh, about historiography also applies to media. 
and publications, mm, we are far too often being portrayed from outside. Studying or portraying an ethnic minority, learning about oppression is not automatically or inherently good. After all, it's possible to only do it in order to learn how to better exclude people, better discriminate, um, in order to derive resources from them, or in order to gain an advantage over them, all of which is vividly shown by the so-called Black Studies Bremen. So being published, being studied, being well received does not hold any intrinsic value when one's intellectual agency is seized which unfortunately is all too frequently the case. Some of us cooperate from time to time uh, with German media productions in order to you know, try to get points across into the mainstream. And it's always a very, very risky endeavor. Um, and it's in and of itself absolutely understandable. Um, it's important that some points are made publicly and also in mainstream media. And it's also important that s some stories are being told. Um, but the results are so far almost without exception films that carry racist titles, for example. Um, for example, Masakoi's book in Germany carries a racist title. Um, or productions that centralize, exclusively centralize white perspectives or a voyeuristic gaze, or films um, containing questionable scenes that are potentially re-traumatizing, productions that don't show any interest whatsoever in empowerment. Uh, that's the majority of, of those productions. And I dare say it's naive to be a colonized minority and at the same time trust the colonizers with showing the nation who we are. So. Um, I will also put up an article about um, which questions we can and should ask ourselves in every encounter with the media, just because I've been working in the media so long and I know every dirty trick. <laughs> you know? And uh, to secure that we keep some sort of control also um, over our own stories. And um, yeah, I'll post the link there at the end of this presentation where you can, can receive links. Um, so in brief, we need to take responsibility for our own stories, and the responsibility does not end with, with the uh, possibility to publish something by whomever. For those of you who are in the process of being approached by white media folks right now, um, just in brief, please thoroughly question anyone's motives and make sure you reserve all rights to the material that displays you or your intellectual property, which includes your biography and never sign anything that grants somebody else uh, to use it how they see fit. Or write me an email. You know, I'm all about control in the publication process. Because let's face it, in documentaries, we can, we can only be misrepresented if we allow it, if we give away control, if we sign something without understanding what we just signed, if we don't negotiate, then it's nobody else's fault if the outcome is not adequate. Um, our biographies are spectacular. They're incredibly rich parables that directly lead to a better understanding of how societies work, how diaspora works, how Europe works, and how resilience works. We need to start regarding each and every one of those biographies as a treasure that is worth protecting. And in my humble opinion, we should stop selling the rights to telling our stories to the first random Jochen who shows some interest, of course. So this is not to say we should not st share our stories, obviously, quite the opposite. I simply think we should share them on our terms and be very careful in the process. So the next suggestion is derived from the South African political proverb going, nothing about us without us is for us. Um, that has been attributed to Nelson Mandela, but I think it was originally by and about black disability, uh, black disability, disability group. So I uh, changed it into everything about us should be by us and for us. Uh, the terms used to discuss black Germans and black people in Germany have traditionally been derogatory. 
They called us all kinds of names. Why? Precisely because we were not included. And we are capable of reproducing these structures today. If we aren't thinking hard, whom did I just forget? If we don't make deliberate efforts to include everyone, then we will, and we do, automatically exclude those who have traditionally been excluded. And that would, for example, be in black German studies, exactly the people who put together this conference, the transnational adoptees and abducted. Because uh, demographically, they are not a huge group. And for us in Germany, they aren't as physically present. Sadly, many of us in Germany rarely include them in our considerations, often about black Germany. And very rarely do black German adoptees get included and acknowledged in any kind of African diasporic studies in general. And this needs to change. The bottom line of, of all these aforementioned points is just be very vigilant about representation. W why did we like the film Black Panther? Because representation matters. You know, where, where do these filmmakers need to do better next time in including Africans <laughs> in the creation process and cast, for example, which is, uh, you know, and a couple of other things. So we tend to be more knowledgeable, more understanding, and more sensitive in the matters of our own representations um, so this is where, where we show some expertise when it's about us, uh, and not so much usually when it's about the groups that we happen to have privilege of. Therefore, it's an, an act of solidarity to represent our own group and help create space and assist those who are made to struggle even harder. In Germany now, we have a very curious situation. The country is proud of its so-called welcome culture, Willkommenskultur, um, yet leaves thousands of refugees to die at the borders of Europe and covers up the fact that every year, for a couple of years now, there have been more than a thousand criminal attacks against refugees and refugee shelters per year, many of which include arson attacks. So welcoming and helping hands also exist but certainly not because of the overall German mainstream welcome culture, but because of Kölsch's individuals. The people being attacked, being killed, and or left to die are, are African siblings. Their voices are being erased in this entire discourse. And there's a nuance we need to be aware of in Germany's uh, perception, the original sin is not to be black. Black people are welcome in Germany. The issue is to be black and demand to stay. It's this combination. It's uh, an experience you're simply not going to make as a tourist or as an expat. And yeah, these were just some of so many possible considerations I, I learned and I invite everyone to make a complete violent for planning our futures. And I um, yeah, suggest we talk about these things a bit more and uh, at the same time continue to write um, all, uh, all our stories as autonomously as possible. My vision for black German studies in the future would be um, yeah, actual faculties led by black German people for black students, with all the support and backup system that is necessary for us to be able to study at all in the hostile environment that is the German academia. And uh, my vision for our activism is that we acknowledge each other's experience, uh, struggle, unique set of skills in overcoming and thriving, that we acknowledge each other's productions of knowledge as immediately and directly as possible, and that we reach out a little bit more. Um, I suggest we regularly reevaluate our own traditions, automatisms in academia and in activism, and then just uh, address the work, the discourse accordingly. We are 
presently in the United Nations International Decade for People of African Descent. So um, yeah, let's make this truly about our cause, as complete as we can, as a, as a complex and, and beautiful, multifaceted, um, diasporic thing, and uh, in close dialogue with, with our neighbor continent, Africa, speaking from a German perspective, the neighbor continent, and um, with each other's best interest in mind, because um, we have overcome so much um, historically and individually, and we share many an experience. So uh, yeah, we could build and, and nurture our collective knowledges with care and, and uh, with love. And because after the decade for people of African descent, um, we have an entire future for people of African descent. Thank you very much. Please go to this link and then you will find the button to collect the, the sources and infos. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, what a powerful uh, talk. Once again, um, you know, Noah's first keynote, I think I almost know it by heart by now. <laughs> and uh, I've written it quite a number of times. And I'm sure that um, I'll be citing this <laughs> quite frequently. Um, but, and we only have a few minutes before we do have to go to our dinner. I'd like to thank you once again for coming. Um, I hope you've really enjoyed this event. And I invite you now to uh, ask Noah or speak with her however you would like for the next few minutes. I think we have about how long? Okay, we have until 5.15, so questions please. Yeah. Noah, uh, there was a gentleman in the uh, first half of the 20th century by the name of Marcus Garvey who uh, started a movement um, in regards to uh, economic autonomy for um, people of African descent, uh, primarily starting from the Americas. This gentleman was of uh, Jamaican descent and um, uh, basically tried to make a, a, a connection, economic connection with the continent of Africa in order to, um, to establish some kind of economic trade route between Africa and the, the Americas. And he also tried to include um, folks of African descent living in Europe as well. And so he ended up learning uh, a number of languages. I'm not sure if German was one of them, but. I know uh, he learned uh, French and uh, and also Spanish and wrote a number of publications in those languages as, as well in order to generate excitement and, um, and interest in developing that kind of uh, move, uh, economic movement so that uh, we would be empowered, so to speak, and of course, um, that activity raised a lot of apprehension um, within the, the, the European power structure that um, had established itself not only in Europe, but also in North America. And um, it seems to me that, that we need to, that we should be drawing, up, drawing on some of these, this knowledge as well uh, to um, move forward. And to acknowledge some of some of what some of what our um, ancestors have done in the past, um, is there any um, suggestions or any awareness on on your part or folks in the movement within Germany of that activity? 
of that historic activity? Yeah, quite extensively so. Um, the issue, the issue is not a lack of knowledge or excitement or or interest. Um, it's simply uh, um, as I wasn't clear enough about probably um, completely different demographic structures. So um, eco economic autonomy needs a critical mass of consumers, for example. You know, how to taking a, an example of, of this era, how to market um, black cosmetics. Um, that was, uh, I believe, became the, the, the first black freelance millionaire lady of the United States. Well, in, in, in a country whose population is like 99% white at that time. You know? So um, it, uh, it's not that we don't know it. We, of course, we know it and we can't help to be uh, yeah, confronted with, uh, with that discourse. Um, it's more that it doesn't apply. And, and, and so for us, it's, it's first and foremost about intellectual autonomy, because what we are able to, to produce autonomously is, uh, is, is intellectual goods. You know? um, and um, yeah, for economic autonomy, that would be... I mean, individuals are trying it, of course, and they always have tried. But it's, um, it's hard enough in, in the United States of America to advertise for people to, to buy black, for example. You know, it's, it's really an issue. It's not like easy if everyone would do it and so many economic you know, things would, would be easier. Uh, and now then imagine that in a country like Germany. or material production. So it's, 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 n it's not just um, producing material goods, but also the, the, tra the um, exchange of, of intellectual goods as well. Is there another question? I was wondering, oh, excuse me, about the term Apo Deutsch. So a couple of years ago, I used it <coughs> And I was scolded by someone that this term only in initially applied to biracial children who were born after World War II, I suppose. I is that true? Mm, of course, there was never an official use for the what? term, and it was a community term. I, th I think this impression might have arisen. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that. I, I think the impression might have arisen because... Um, the the people in in the movement that led to the coining of the of the self denomination Afro Deutsch, uh, many of them shared a similar background or or appeared to share a similar background, to be of a similar background, and there simply weren't many people with um, uh, both African parents, for example, or migrants um, immediately from Africa within this movement at that time. Not saying that they weren't there or there were none, but they weren't the predominant group. So I think from still from this time, one one could get the impression that Afrodeutsch meant a certain a certain um, uh, Herk Herkunft. Uh, what's the um, origin? Yes, thank you. A certain origin only or a certain group, and and um, and yeah, for that reason also, some are quite touchy, and and and. Um, with the subject, and I understand that some some people don't don't want to apply it to themselves or don't accept it for this reason. And this per same person told me that in her experience, she was her, both her parents came from Africa, and she felt that the leadership 
of a lot of or too many organization is led by people who are biracial. So what would you say to that? I would say she's absolutely 100% right. You know, I, I, I would say that um, it took far too long to, to recognize this and address this. And, and, and uh, it's even an issue by now and will continue to be because it's, it's uh, an issue of, of um, structural imbalance, of asymmetry, of, of racism, colorism. And um, it permeates the entire society and, and we're part of the society. And it's, um, it, we should also talk a lot more about these things. And just the other day we, um, we sat together and, and said, well, you know, there is light skin privilege going on all over the place. Like, for example, if, if, if I had um, two black African parents and, and uh, also not the, the privilege of, of language, of growing up with a German language, um, I would be nowhere near where I am. So it's not because of my merits. <laughs> it's for that reason of privilege. So um, I think your, your friend or whoever you talked about that is, is completely right. Uh, thank you, Noah. Thank you very much. It was um, very insightful and inspiring. Um, I really would like to have that quote uh, on our biography, The Spectacular. Maybe that sentence, I would like to quote it, so maybe you can um, share it later. Um, Sorry, which quote again? When you started the sentence saying, Our biography, The Spectacular, Ah, okay. And then it ends with the treasure, okay. so I would love to quote that. Um, I also really appreciate the point you made about the German Willkommenskultur. I think this is um, a really important issue that needs to um, be thematized publicly. Um, from witnessing it also in Germany, I think there's really a deep issue going on how people are being exploited. People who are coming to Germany right now are being led in to be totally exploited um, to work and uh, under really very hard circumstances. I'm not sure if people are aware of this in other countries. And the parallels with people um, being stopped at the border, being taken all their jewelry or their money, and then having to work for free. So I really see parallels being myself of black and Jewish descent. It really hurts to hear this contemporarily. So thank you for also mentioning that. I have a question about when you say, um, actively search for more sources or do our own research, including but not limited to online, if you have a, a concrete examples that you want to share from your practice. Um, I don't know if that's something you want to share now, but because your book is so well researched, like I'd just be interested in knowing more. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Um, yeah, for example, um, yeah, w one, one example would be to the, the, the recently reaching out from, from a Af Afro-Turkish young Germans to the um, yeah, Afro, Afro, Afro Deutsch Turkish <laughs> young Germans to reaching out to their Afro Turkish communities and um, I think uh, most of that is is based on online well the the research the word of mouth that they exist it doesn't come from online but then actually connecting you know m much of that has been done online and now there's even there's an exchange so yeah fly over and, and talk. And um, also lately we've been trying to um, find more um, people from Eastern um, European countries, just because we also um, think that, that they are like be being, you know, we are, we are kind of steamrolling them in the discourse because we're like Europe this and Europe that and completely forget about the Eastern European experience that um, yeah, we are privileged over in, in our writings, our meetings, and why are they always absent? Um, you know, it's not their fault. Probably struggle, struggle more. So this would be an example of um, if you, if we if we it wasn't for internet and, and, and for for actively just using search machines and, and, and archives of, of, of newspapers in, in some languages that are online, then it would be really hard. You know, would have to fly to Warsaw and run around long enough to <laughs> to meet people. Which is pos possible too, but it's just easier to do it online and then just connect virtually and then see if maybe that's 
one of the next conferences that's possible for us. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, I'm wondering about what's happening with teachers and, and especially at the, the Grundschule level. I, I Because universities are also then producing the people who are teaching these kids, uh, many of whom then you know get on the sort of Hauptschule track before they've even gotten into the first grade. And so is there also work happening at, at that level, at the school level? So activism or grassroots work is, is, is happening on every level, but it's not structurally, you know, really it can only always just cover a pool of a handful of people because we don't we lack the structures or the or the or the power in the um, in the education to become a Grundschule teacher. Um, um, what's what's it called? The Grundschule the, um, elementary school. Thanks, thanks much. In uh, in the Ausbildung to become elementary school teacher. Um, context of, of bias, you know, understanding of bias or how societal mechanisms work stuff like that is super limited like um, I know some people who teach it there and and uh, they say it's it's almost it's almost non-existent because as soon as they can introduce these concepts and, and try it there's a discussion that, that emerges around it from from those who aren't ready yet to, to hear that that takes up the entire space of what should actually be a teaching unit that is small enough in the first place, but then is even even the small teaching unit is completely occupied by this. So um, the universities themselves or the curricula certainly don't um, present any any answer or any any willingness to 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 solve this or to even recognize that it's an issue. And mostly on a, on a on a um, on an NGO level, it is usually perceived as as uh, programs against something, you know, against, not, not even against bias, but for example, against right-wing extremism or against whatever. But um, just like in, uh, in our um, education about uh, Nationalsozialism or about the, the Nazi terror, um, also not, not openly or not honestly really uh, teaching about the mechanics you know, th th there's much teaching in, 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 in schools, mandatory teaching about the era of Nationalsozialism, but none of it, it is actually honest. Um, we learn, for example, that the, the Nazis uh, killed the, the, the Jewish population. You know, it's not the Germans. You know, it's, it's sort of like, or an UF UFO landed and, and Adolf got out of this UFO and then with his friends and, you know, and he killed everybody. And then the UFO disappeared again, and then all the people were free. And it's actually what we learn. So no connection whatsoever to 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 the psyche, to how society works, and so on. So what people do now is uh, student groups, mostly students of color, or led by students of color, um, try to decolonize their own curriculum for the for their education to become teachers and, uh, and and try to get some money out of the universities to implement at least lecture series they then attend freiwillig you know it's not part of the curriculum they don't even get credits for it not even for organizing it and some do pretty good job but it's only in in two or three large cities i think we might have time for one two I'm gonna stop. Thank you so much. Now I enjoy always hearing you speak. Um, I was wanted to kind of bring it back to your earlier work with the edutainment attacker, and I loved watching those on there in the YouTube. And um, <laughs> if, if <laughs> I did really like it, um, so I, I wanted to talk about if you were still working in a band and if you were going to continue that type of work, or or maybe your evolution process away from it. So I was just wondering if you could talk about that process a little bit. Wow, you remember the entertainment attack? <laughs> yeah. Oh. yeah, I had a lot of fun doing it. 
Actually, I retired from the stage. I, um, I quit um, the edutainment attacker. For those of you who don't know, it was a stage show based on Deutschland Schwarz-Weiß and also in the book of a colleague of mine, Mutlu Ergül, who wrote a work of fiction about a, 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 a German-Turkish guy who is very empowered in, in Berlin. And so we did a sort of a critical whiteness or, or bias, anti-racism, decolonial, whatever. Stage play, stage show with a quiz and, uh, and music and uh, a lot of stand-up comedy and just our sense of humor. That was very successful and that was an issue after a couple of years because, um, because um, usually it was white organizations who booked the play and um, there weren't enough people of color in the audience and um, in, in dialogue with our booking agency and, and with the groups organizing it, um, I found out that um, they usually didn't invite the, the self-organizations. They sort of booked it for themselves. Yes, they, they had us come there and, and uh, entertain them. That's what it was about, and 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 once I once I realized this, I was so shocked. I was like, "Wow, how oh seriously, I'm participating in, in people wanting to learn about bias by me entertaining them, making them laugh, while not thinking about how it could be empowering for the people of color in the same city, not even reaching out to them, be like, "Okay, your folks are coming, won't you? You know, come too." I was so pissed about this. So I had to, to stop it and, and sort of put the handbrake in and said, I need to think about this because it's just wrong the way it is right now. Also, there was an incident with um, when, when we, you know, read very empowering chapters from, from our books. One revolved around hair and then a, a, a one, one line happened twice, actually. White people would, would grab into a black person's hair sitting in front of them. So while we talked about like what is wrong with white people, like touching black person's hair without asking, they just did that. And it was like, okay, if we can't create a safe a enough atmosphere, as hard as we try, then I'm not, I'm not ready to, to, to be a part of this. So, and, and just in total, the body and the gaze, I never really... I never was able to, to, to make it work for me in Germany. There's if, there's if, if you're interested in it, there's a, a short documentary about it. Like the last couple of performances I made was in absence uh, where I installed performance drones. I would travel to the city with all my gear, but go to a place like upstairs in the next building and then just had the camera film, my, film all my, my electronic gear and uh, the audience would just watch the, my hands with the electronic gear on the screen and listen to it like, like a radio play and watch it like a, I don't know, a painting or something. But I would take my body out of the equation. And eventually that also was like, a, why though? <laughs> why? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, sorry. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, but I think this is time we've got to and at least in this forum, um, we welcome you to our dinner and we hope that these conversations will continue over and over and again, um, even outside of this place. And I'm always optimistic, so I will say I look forward to seeing you at our next conference. <laughs>